coming up on Garden Talk. Don't ever go by what the bottle says. Just do half. So pretty much every line that I have run, I've basically started off with a quarter to a half. So when I'm transplanting, I basically just do my bottom layer of soil, and then where I'm going to transplant in, I just sprinkle the, the azos and the mycos right on top of there. You don't have to even use very much. Just look at your plants. Look at what they're doing. Uh, do they look happy? Are they droopy? Do, do they show signs of deficiencies? You know, are they nice and green? Or are, do they have spots on them? Are they yellowing? Do your research on what your plants look like. If you're spotting something that doesn't look normal, research it. What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, AKA Mr. Grow It and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 15. In this episode, I interview Painted Lady. Some of you may know her from the Michigan Bros Grow Show or her Instagram where she shows off her garden. She has been gardening various plants outdoors her entire life, so you could say her family raised her as a gardener. In this episode, we have a beginner-friendly discussion on the basics of feeding plant nutrients. She has experience using several different bottle lines of nutrients, and she talks about her experience using them. She also gives some great tips for success when it comes to feeding. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and click the thumbs up button. If you're listening to this podcast on one of the podcast platforms such as Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. And if you're liking these episodes and want to support the podcast even more, you can do that through Patreon. The link is patreon.com slash mrgrowit. I'll also link it down in the YouTube description section below. Before we get into the episode, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this episode, Mars Hydro. Mars Hydro sent me over their new LED grow light, the FCE6500. This grow light is a bar style design that's similar to the FC6500, but there are some differences. This FCE6500 has six light bars that are detachable and movable on the light frame. This allows you to change the light intensity and distribution across the grow space. It has 3,978 bridge lux chips and a Moso driver that is dimmable. It pulls 650 watts from the wall and covers a 5 foot by 5 foot grow space for bloom and a 6 foot by 6 foot grow space for veg. The FC6500 also pulls 650 watts and has the same coverage area, but it comes with 8 light bars that are attached to the frame. This LED grow light has 2688 Samsung LM301 and Osram 660 nanometer chips and a dimmable Inventronics driver. Visit MarsHydro.com, I'll leave a link down in the YouTube description section below, and use coupon code MrGrowIt for a discount on any of their products. All right, let's get into the episode. Okay, here we are, Painted Lady, welcome to Garden Talk. How are you? I'm great, thanks so much for having me, I appreciate it. Right, thanks for coming on. I actually saw your interview recently with Photosyntech. And uh, yeah. really good interview. You talked about a ton of good information. Get to learn more about you. Uh, and, you know, after hearing that, I'm like, I got to get her on my podcast. Got to get her on. So. Oh, well, thank you so much for checking it out. Yeah, I was really stoked to have him reach out to me. And and it was a fun podcast. And, and I'm glad that you saw it because, you know, I followed you for years. So this is this is great. I appreciate, again, having you have me on. So for those who don't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm born and raised in Michigan, and I've always been a gardener. My mom kind of just uh, ingrained that in me as a little child. It was kind of my punishment. Go out and weed the garden. Well, that wasn't a punishment for me, actually. I kind of enjoyed it. So I've always been a gardener, and I started growing medicinal plants about five, six years ago. Um, and I just, I just love it. It's just become my passion. Like I said, I'm from Michigan, and... It gets cold here in the winter and it is so nice. I indoor grow, I'm a caregiver here in Michigan and I do have patients. So I always wanna make sure that I have the best possible product for my patients and, and going down there and spending time in my garden, especially in the winter when the nice warm place to go with artificial sun is just, you know, just it's my happy place and spending time down there just makes my plants happy too. And I think it shows so. Uh, yeah, that's how I got into to gardening. I uh, found medicinal plants at an early age because of chronic migraines. And I just have really been um, a proponent of it ever since. And, you know, it just has been something that I've been looking at doing professionally. So 
um, yeah, that's a little bit about me and, and I can now be found, uh, the guys from Michigan Bros Grow Show found me somehow. I was a fan and I would watch and participate in the chats when they would have their live shows and they asked me to join the panel and so now I'm on the Michigan Bros Grow Show on Sunday and Monday nights and asking questions and answering questions as best I can and and uh, yeah, it's really been uh, fun and I can't even, I can't even begin to tell you how beneficial it's been in my life. So the gardening and everything about it. And so, yeah, it's, it's been fantastic and I can't wait to keep doing this and hope to do it professionally sometime soon. That's cool. One of the things in that podcast that really stuck out to me is that you've used a whole bunch of different types of nutrients yep. that kind of prompted this interview here is our discussion, whatever, um, to talk about, you know, what the topic is today, which is the basics of feeding plants nutrients. There are diff several different types of nutrients out there, right? There's synthetic and there's organic. Now, some people might look at the title of this video, which is the basics of feeding plants nutrients, and they might say, feed the soil, not feed the plant. Right. So there is actually such thing as feeding the plant. And there's actually a such thing as feeding the soil, right? So that's when we talk about synthetic versus organic. So synthetic nutrients, most bottled lines, I, I believe, are synthetic nutrients. They're smaller molecules. And basically, when you're mixing those nutrients into water, um, you know, they're water-soluble. They're in a plant-available form. So the plant can immediately uptake those nutrients. You're feeding the plant in that sense. Organic, on the other hand, organic inputs, organic, organic amendments, um, that's not in a form that's immediately available for the plant, right? So what ne needs to happen first is the microbial life in the soil needs to break down those inputs uh, and put them into that plant available form. So they'll break down or they'll eat those amendments, crap them out, right? And then they're kind of in that plant available form that uh, can be uptaken by the plant. So Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a um, delay, I, I guess you can kind of say, is, you know, the synthetic nutrients are immediately, immediately available for the plant. They can uptake it right away. If you're coming across a deficiency, there should be a pretty decent, there's going to be a quicker recovery off of synthetic nutrients than organics because organics, you need to, uh, it needs to be broken down by those microbes first. So it takes a little bit longer. So feeding the plant versus feeding the soil. So that being said, uh, do you grow with, uh, I know you've grown with synthetic nutrient, uh, said, bleh, yep. I can't speak. I know you've <laughs> grown with synthetic nutrients in the past. Um, do you also grow with organic nutrients? I do actually. Uh, I'm kind of, uh, gap bridging the gap right now of the two, because I was originally shown and I learned with synthetic nutrients. I started off with Fox farm, which I think we've probably, you know, if you've ever run synthetic nutrients, uh, pretty much everybody's either heard of it or run it and that's where I learned and so um, yeah I just learned with bottled synthetic newts and I've kind of bridged or I've kind of run the whole gamut I guess you could you could say between Fox Farm and then I moved to GH and Veg Bloom and Advance and I bought all those bottles like that whole line I thought I had to have all of them you know to make sure that my plant was getting everything that it needed and uh, I just found that you don't. And so I kind of wanted to understand what I was actually feeding my plants. What's in that bottle of Fox Farm, you know, Tiger Bloom that I'm going to be giving to my plants. So that's when I kind of switched over to organic and wanted to understand exactly like you were saying, feeding the soil instead of feeding the actual plant and the difference there. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a completely different world. Um, like you were saying, deficiencies, you can't just solve overnight. Uh, that, that's a little bit difficult for me to understand knowing that, you know, with a synthetic line, I can just grab that little bottle of, you know, nitrogen or whatever, if it's lacking something and within a couple, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, we're good to go. But yeah, I, I've really been enjoying learning more about organics and feeding the soil and what I need to do to keep my plants happy with that. Same with me. I've used synthetics for, I think I used Fox Farm Trio for the first six years of my life, of six oh, years wow. of growing. 
Uh, and then I started venturing out into other lines and now eventually worked my way into the organic side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so just like you. Uh, but you, but both of us kind of do have uh, experience growing a bunch of different, using a bunch of different bottled lines, right? Yep. So uh, before we get into those different bottled lines that we've used and kind of tips on using those different bottled lines, let's talk about water, let's talk about pH, ppm, and EC. Sure. So uh, what type of water do you typically use? You know, do you use tap water, do you use well water, RO, rainwater? I am straight tap water. It's coming right out of the tap here in my city in Michigan. Um, and you know, I run about the, yes, I do check pH and EC for sure. When I'm running synthetics, you definitely need to know what you're giving your plant and what your plant is giving back out. So, uh, yeah, I, de I definitely check pH and my water here is not too horrible. It runs usually around, uh, an eight. Um, so it, it's not terrible, but it's not, uh, it's not great either. So I definitely have to make sure I adjust after I add my nudes. And sometimes you find with the, um, bottled nutrient lines, they kind of adjust themselves. They're somehow regulated and uh, believe me, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know how it works, but however it works, they just, it's it, some kind, but sometimes after you add all of what you need to add to give your plant what it needs, it kind of balances that pH for you. But always check to make sure because you want to make sure that your plant is getting the right amount of nutrients and the only way that you can do that is by having the correct ph and going in and going out so um yeah i definitely check all that and i just use straight tap water ph it and check the ec um ec usually i run uh well, i usually do ppms i know that's kind of most people have a preference I, I usually do ppms and i usually do about a three to six in early veg, three to 600 PPMs early veg, and a 600 to 900 mid to late veg, and then bump it up from there into flower. And, uh, and I like to stay about a 6.2 to 6.5 pH generally when I'm running a bottled line. Got it, that makes sense. And for watering, you know, you mentioned you use tap water. A lot of tap water comes with either chlorine or chloramine, which can be harmful for the microbes in the soil. Do mm -hmm. you do anything with the tap water before you mix your nutrients in? Do you like let it sit out so the chlorine dissipates? Or do you even have chlorine or a chloramine in your local water? Or Ours, I have checked it and it doesn't seem to be too bad. The it, Right straight out of the tap, it's coming out at about 200, 250 ppms. It's not too too bad so i don't worry too much about adding extra to the water or letting it sit i kind of let my plants tell me how they feel and if my plants look happy with the way that the you know with the system that i'm using now which is generally not waiting or adding anything to my tap water then uh, i I, den I tend to just leave it as it is if my plants look happy then i'm happy and that's something to keep in mind when you're using these bottled nutrients is what your PPM is coming out of the tap, right? PPM or, or EC is coming out of the tap because the nutrients you mix up is going to be in addition to that, right? So For sure. uh, if your yeah. feeding chart says 500 PPM is, is this mixture, um, you know, grow A, grow B, whatever, uh, that's going to be on top of what is coming out of your tap. So uh, yeah, actually in my local area, we have chlorine. Uh, and it actually comes out of the tap at like 485 PPM, Ooh, which wow. is extremely high. I think EPA guidelines is no higher than 500. I think if it's over 500, it's unsafe uh, to drink or whatever. Yeah. Um, so mine's very, very high. And then I looked at my local water report and they do have a breakdown of what's in there. And I was pretty surprised to see that of the 485 PPM, 80 PPM is sodium. So actually, when I used, I did a grow with tap water. I did, I've done several grows with tap water over the years, but um, one in particular, I did a grow with tap water. Then I got a soil sample from Logan mm -hmm. Labs, and my sodium level was through the roof. Oh, wow. Uh, so for those that don't know, Logan Labs does soil samples. I think genuinely it's recommended to do a soil sample between grows. Uh, some, may buy, some may advise differently on that one, but there are consultants out there that you can sit down and look over your soil sample with and they'll give you guidance on what amendments you need to add or whatever to kind of rebalance that soil which which is pretty cool but yeah i was really surprised with 80 ppm of sodium and that there was such a build up there um, so that's something that that folks should certainly be aware of um you know when they're using tap water yeah i definitely did not 
consider that when I first started. I wasn't even thinking about it until I think I saw one somebody's video, one of the YouTube videos that I went, might have even been you actually. And uh, yeah, and I didn't even think about, oh my gosh, I got to add the that number to the actual end result to make sure I'm getting the right amount of PPMs into my plants. So yeah, definitely got to keep an eye on all that stuff for sure. Cool. So we talked about pH. You, t- you talked about what your ideal range is. You talked about PPM, yeah. what your ideal ranges are. Good. Um, now let's talk about top feeding versus bottom feeding. Traditional way to feed your plants is to mix up nutrients, maybe put it in a pitcher or a sprayer or something, and then feed on the top, right? You do a soil drench from the top. Mm-hmm. I heard on your on that interview with Photosyntech that you do bottom feeding, or what you like to call butt chugging. Right? Yep. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about bottom feeding versus top feeding and sure. maybe some of the benefits, uh, so on and so forth? Yeah, um, I, I do a regular podcast, the Michigan Bros Grow Show, and we they kind of have shown me the way, as we call it, butt chugging with bottom watering. I was always a top water. I always just filled up a bucket, added my nutrients, and just poured it right over the top, um, just like I do with my plants outside in my garden. And I, I just never really thought about bottom watering or the benefits of why you would want a bottom water as opposed to just pouring it right over the top. And I found there's so many benefits to quote unquote butt chugging. And I know that that's a a term that a lot of people in the industry either love or hate. You either giggle or you don't. And we just giggle at it. You know, it's just, it's just something that a term that we like to use. And it's just kind of, just kind of gives us a little bit extra giggle when we're down there watering. So generally I just take the same amount of water that I would have poured over the top and pour it in the reservoir at the bottom. And that eliminates a lot of problems that you can come across with fungus gnats and pests with, um, you know, having the top layer of that soil being a little bit damp can cause a little bit of a problem if you've ever found that. And the butt chugging just really seems to eliminate that problem altogether. And, you know, it just also, it's just so much, I, a lot of people call it the lazy man's way of watering too. I don't know if you've ever used radical bags or fabric bags. A lot of times if you pour that water right over the top, it can run right off the sides, especially in those radical bags. So the bottom bottom watering, the butt chugging sure eliminates that problem all the way around. So your nutrients aren't going right off the side and into on the floor or whatever or in the reservoir. So yeah, that's, I just have really become a fan of bottom watering for, for all, both of those reasons. Gotcha. Okay. So let's start talking about these bottle lines. Now, before we actually get into each bottle line individually, there's a question I want to ask you. So when I mm-hmm. first started getting, I think I was on Fox farm. I was growing with that for six years, like I mentioned. Yeah. And I was just starting to venture out into new lines and I asked growers with more experience, so I mean, you know, which line should I try? Should I try this one? Should I try this one? This one looks good. That one looks good. You know, so on and so forth. And the general consensus among a, a lot of these growers with experience with uh, several bottle lines, and I was a little bit surprised on this, is that they're saying a lot of these lines are very, very similar to the point where you should just pick one and go with it, right? And we're talking base nutrients. So mostly synthetic lines are going to have base nutrients, Mm -hmm. and then they're going to have additives on top of it, right? So base nutrients typically consists of two, maybe three bottles. Like uh, I know Blue Planet Nutrients has a Blue Max Part uh, A, Part B. Fox Farm has the Fox Farm Trio, three bottles Mm -hmm. of nutrients. Uh, There are several lines out there that have either two bottles or three bottles of their base nutrients, and then they have additives beyond that. That being said... Would you agree or disagree with these lines being very similar to where you should just kind of pick one and go with it? In my experience, I didn't find that they were similar at all. Um, I, I just, the, the Fox Farm may be a little similar to the GH, I thought. Uh, but once I switched over to Veg Bloom and having the powder nudes as opposed to the bottles, that was completely new for me. Um, and the advanced nutrients just seem to separate every single thing out into a different bottle. And so, I mean, obviously for certain purposes, but, um, yeah, I, I found that 
I think that they all had a different flavor. I think they all had a different result. In my experience, in my environment anyway, they did. So uh, I, that's why I chose to kind of experiment throughout the different lines because I wanted to see the differences and what it would bring and if this one would bring a different flavor or more terps than this one. So um, yeah, I, I tend to think that they all have their own advantages and disadvantages and, and I've really found my niche now with, it's not really, it's not synthetic, it's an organic bottled nutrient with bloom yellow bottles which is an Australian company who I found through you, funny enough. Um, I obviously used to watch your videos when I was first starting out religiously. And one time you chose to use the Bloom Yellow Bottles. I believe they sent you a sample or something and, and your girls were loving it and I paid attention. And so when I was uh, at a local girl store, I found that they had, they had a little expo and the guy from Bloom Yellow Bottles was there and sent me home with a sample of the whole line and it is organic and but it is bottles and um i i just my plants in my environment just really really love it and i have stuck with them ever since nice nice i'm glad to hear that you've gotten success off of them and yeah. uh yeah i definitely i liked using them i wasn't too too happy about the amount of bottles that they have i think they have like 18 different bottles to yeah. total when you talk about their, their foiler sprays and stuff like that but um but yeah, again, I think you can get away with just the, the Grow A and the Grow B. Um, I think they have one Grow A, Grow B for veg, Grow A B, B, and B for flower, I believe, yep. right? Yeah. Um, do you use just those or what other um, bottles uh, do you use from Bloom Yellow Bottles? And do you have any tips for using Bloom Yellow Bottles? We'll start with them. Yeah, sure. Uh, I do use quite a few, but I have found that you can really narrow it down to just basically, like you said, the bases, the A and Bs in, in veg and flower. And I really think that the plants benefit from uh, humates. Humates, and then they have a sea minerals line. There's a seaweed, uh, sea fuel, and sea minerals that I think have really, really uh, made a difference in the plants and their health. So uh, those are the main ones uh, aside from their other product, which is a roots product. Obviously, uh, um, you know, that, that helps, you know, create your rise of fear and make sure that everything is getting, getting all good and the microbes are doing their job to make sure the plant can uptake those nutrients that you're feeding them. Now, do you follow their feeding schedule that they put out on their website? And uh, if so, do you do the full dose like they recommend or do you do half dose or, or what? No, I don't. And I, th I don't think any of us synthetic growers or bottle newts growers ever actually do. Um, I always probably start with either a quarter to a half of what they recommend on the bottle just to make sure I, I don't want to burn my plant. And you can always... Oh, you can always correct, but you can take away. So if you're feeding right out of the gate what they're recommending, sometimes your plants may not be used to it at that point. So I generally try to get away with less is more. <laughs> so I, I do. I just generally try to take a look at my plants. Are they happy? Are they showing any kind of deficiency? If they are, that's when you can correct. But generally, I take the less is more approach, and that seems to be working for me. Got it. And then when you add it to your water, are you adjusting the, P are you looking at the pH then, pH PPN, are you adjusting the pH then? And what do you use to adjust the pH if you do? You know what, I don't tend to worry about it too much with the organics. Uh, with the bloom yellow bottles, I, g I generally kind of leave my blue lab pens to the side until later in flower when I want to make sure um, everything is, is okay and towards, you know, getting towards the end. I want to make sure that those, that plant is flushing properly and make sure that all that nutrients are out of there. But, um, for the most part, no, yeah, I, I kind of put the pH pen away with the bloom yellow bottles. It's only when I'm running like a, you know, a veg bloom or, um, you know, GH or, or one of those lines that I tend to use them a lot. But, you know, for the most part, uh, the bloom yellow bottles seem to kind of adjust I have checked it um, I, after adding just to see, just to make sure that I'm not crazy out of whack. And it seems to kind of settle around an acceptable range for my plants. So I generally just don't try to mess with it. I feel like like going back to what I said before, less is more. Why add that acid or, you know, if you don't have to with the pH up or pH down. I just, you know, those blue and orange and all this, you know, I just would rather 
less is more. That makes sense. Yeah, I would assume, I mean, you said you were coming in at like eight something pH to begin with your tap. Uh, you know, I assume after adding those nutrients, I would assume it would drop into that acceptable yeah. range. And then once you add those in, your microbes actually adjust the pH range in the soil as well. And you know, right. the whole organic side of things as well. So a lot of people say that when you're organics, you don't have to check pH. You don't have to check PPM, et cetera, et cetera. So that's pretty cool that, that that's how that works out for you. Yeah, they're doing well with it, and I can't, you know, I, I can't say anything bad about that company or, um, you know, the line. It's it's just really, really worked well in my environment. I mean, everybody's environment is different. So for me, yeah, you know, I'm a basement grower here in Michigan with, you know, cement black walls, and, and I do have a, a pretty nice setup, and then I have separate veg and flower rooms. I, I don't have to grow in a tent, which um, can be trying at the same time, uh, not growing in a tent because you have a bigger space to have to try to control that environment. But those yellow bottles just, I don't know with, a, with my, I'm an LED grower too. So under all those LEDs and, and you know, the blue yellow bottles just seem to be really making my girls happy. Let's move on to Fox Farm nutrients. Can you talk a little bit about your experience using Fox Farm? Any tips you have for that? Uh, that was the very first line I ever used coming out the gate. My mentor was the one that used Fox Farm. And so uh, he showed me the way with that three-part system. And I was always, I, I don't know what it is. It, maybe it's just kind of a mental thing for me. But I, I don't like to eat any foods with like food color, like massive food, like blue and green and red food coloring. And like, I noticed with Fox Farm, that I had kind of these weird colors and and I just, I don't know. I, I just, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I just would kind of put that in there and in the water and I'm kind of thinking, this is kind of like miracle grow. And I don't know, it just, it just really seemed unnatural to me, I guess. So I, I quickly moved away from Fox Farm um, and all those other lines. I, I really wanted to try to kind of get away from from everything um, that just didn't seem natural to me, I guess. And maybe that makes me not a synthetic grower now, but <laughs> now that I've found Bloom Yellow Bottles. But um, yeah, I really, the only experience I had with Fox Farm was the initial first few runs and it works, it works great. Um, but I found once I switched to the other lines and especially with the Bloom Yellow Bottles, the flavor and the terpene profile just seemed to to explode. So um, nothing against Fox Farm or anybody who uses it, but that was my experience. And I just kind of was like, hmm, let's try something different. Interesting. Yeah, I started with Fox Farm. Like I mentioned earlier, I grew with for six years. I grew with Fox Farm, started with the trio, um, <laughs> overfed my plants at first. It's a very, very <laughs> concentrated line. Yes. And you look at their feeding chart and their PPMs are, are way out of whack. And just so people are aware, maybe, you know, there's a lot of new growers watching this, right? When you're looking at these feeding charts, understand that the PPMs they mention are for a wide variety of plants. I think a lot of people jump to the assumption that this is for the medicinal plant. Um, you know, medicinal plants can take less than what's recommended on the feeding charts. That's why you often hear about people doing a half dose, people doing a quarter dose. Now, for me, with Fox Farm, uh, I would actually do a third dose. So do a third, sometimes even a quarter dose of Fox Farm nutrients, their Fox Farm trio, so the three bottles that it consists of. And when I was running HPS, that's all I needed was those three bottles. I would, uh, you know, pH adjust using pH up or pH down. Uh, and then, of course, monitor the the, R, uh, the pH and PPM of the runoff as well, and then kind of make adjustments there. Um, but uh, but I had good success with Fox Farm nutrients. But actually, one thing I found is that once I switched to LED, I started getting calcium deficiency. Oh, okay. And I was advised to add in an additive, CalMag, which a lot of people are familiar with, and that solved the problem. You know, we'll talk a little bit about additives uh, as we're going through these lines or, or maybe after we go through these lines, but CalMag was an additive that I added with it, particularly, particularly when using LEDs. And then one other thing was I found with some particular cultivars or phenos was I would see phosphorus deficiency in mid-flowering, and okay. I used Beastie Blooms, which is a PK booster by Fox Farm. And that solved my problems. I would add it week four, five, and six only. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, and that would completely solve my uh, phosphorus issue. Have you used any other additives at all or no? Oh, sure. Yeah, I use, um, occasionally I will add, I do still have a couple of those other lines that I use. So in flour, uh, I don't really add too many additives in veg, but in flour, I definitely add uh, occasionally some shine by veg, veg bloom. Um, I think that really adds uh, density and some weight uh, to the product, to the end result. And I also like to use New Millennium's um product also and i'm drawing a blank on what the name of it is the um the frost booster you know what i'm talking about uh winter frost familiar with that line. Jeez, oh, okay. Pete. <laughs> winter frost yeah uh i i like to add that in flour too i think it adds a little bit of a little bit of frost to the girls so um but and obviously bloom yellow bottles does have a, a calcium additive that i do think is essential uh, especially with growing with LEDs. So um, definitely have to add CalMag and I do add a couple of the little bloom boosters there for for density and shine. And that was when you were using Fox Farm? Or are you talking about just in general? No, but I, I still use them to this day, even with my okay. bloom. I'll, mm. I'll add, I think it adds a little bit of extra. Um, I kind of developed that system on my own as opposed to when I was running that Fox Farm system with my mentor. Um, he would add bud swell i can't even remember the name of the company i don't know i don't think it's a fox farm company he would always add bud swell and a couple other things for late end stage flower um, boost but uh, as far as any other additives too much with the fox farm line that was about it let's move on to general hydroponics so that's actually a line that i've never used i uh, see a lot of people use it with success general hydro can you talk a little bit about your experience using that um, i know their feeding chart in particular you definitely have to do a half dose with that one as yeah. well. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I we pretty much when I my mentor and I he basically told me right out of the gate, don't ever go by what the bottle says. Just do half. So pretty much every line that I have run, I've basically started off with a quarter to a half. I even would do a quarter sometimes because I'd be too afraid to burn them. Uh, yeah, so uh, with J with GH, same thing. I always fed them a half, and that seemed to be doing pretty well. I never had a problem with deficiencies too much with GH or, or anything, but I just didn't think that that terp profile was there. Um, it just, I don't know, it just seemed to be lacking a little something for me, and maybe it was my environment, or maybe it was me. I don't know. I, you know, I was running it when I was early growing, and, and uh, maybe it was something I was doing wrong, but uh, as far as uh, the GH line, definitely half strength for sure because they are pretty concentrated in like fox farm with gh did you run any additives on top they have a, what is it is it three bottles with gh the base nutrients oh my god this was so many years ago i think <laughs> it was i think so and i've run so many you know advanced had like 20 some bottles it seems like so it's hard for me to remember but yeah i think they were a three-parter and then we used the same additives with the Fox Farm. I, I just took his additives that he used with the Fox Farm and tried them with the GH. So I would add that bud swell. And there was another one that we used to use that I think got banned actually. And I can't remember what the name of that one was now, but you definitely have to know what you're feeding your plants. At least I want to know what I'm feeding them. And you know, if that stuff's getting banned, why, why is it getting banned? So yeah, it might've been a PGR. Plant I'm growth guessing. regulator, which yeah, which I'm is guessing. highly controversial and uh, yes, yeah. my mentor was all about yield, and I am not. <laughs> I am about quality, so yeah, it was probably was. Gotcha. Now getting into advanced nutrients, this is a line that you had mentioned has a ton of different bottles there. Uh, I've never used advanced. I've heard nightmare stories. People have a lot of success with it. The the nightmare stories that I hear is just that. Um, I heard that they're overpriced. I heard that, um, you know, the salespeople try to sell you all their bottles when you don't actually need all their bottles and, and so on and so forth. So can you tell me a little bit about like advanced nutrients, you know, the base nutrients that they have, maybe the additives you used with them, mm -hmm. so on and so forth? Sure. Yeah. I actually loved advanced when I first started running them as opposed to the Fox farm and, and the GH because they had that pH perfect system. So it, it was easy. You know, you added that three part. I think it was a, I used the micro grow and bloom 
line um, from them. And so, yeah, Mike added that every time, and uh, my my plants loved it. I can't. I don't have anything bad to say about that about them in any way other than they did seem to separate every single bottle or every single possible nutrient out into a separate bottle. And then it just seemed like they had so many different lines of the same nutrient. Like they had three different roots products. And I was always kind of like, I don't get it, but okay, you know. <laughs> and in the end, I kind of thought that everything tasted the same. I would run several different strains together in the same room. And at the end, it seemed to me that everything tasted the same and smelled the same and it had the same terp profile. So again, maybe this is going back to, I know the GH or whatever, maybe I did something wrong, but it just, um, just didn't seem to do it for me. So that's when I, I wanted something else. I, I, I knew that there was medicinal plants that tasted different from each other. So obviously I wanted to find out how I could make that happen. And, and that's when I ended up switching from advanced over to bloom. I found them and it, wow, what a difference. It was a huge difference, but advanced it, it's good company. A uh, lot of bottles, very expensive, but they grow good plants. I, I don't have anything bad to say about them there. My plants were happy. Let's talk a little bit more about their pH perfect that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, a little bit familiar with that. You might be able to correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, from my understanding, it's basically once you add in those nutrients into water, it's going to be in the ideal range of pH for plants so that you don't have to use pH up and pH down and go go back and forth potentially trying to get it into that particular range. Yeah, chasing Is that it. correct? Yeah. Yeah. And it was great. And I even did check it. Um, I used to use the old school, you know, the little plastic bottles and the, you know, check the color with the drops and everything before I got a blue lab pen. Um, makes things so much easier. But uh, yeah, I would check it just to make sure it just like this can't possibly like I just added all of this stuff. It can't possibly. But every time it was perfect. And I don't know the technology, just the, the way that they have you running their system. Obviously the scientists have put that together so that they know that this one is going to adjust it to this point so that, you know, you're feeding the plants in that correct range so that they can uptake the nutrients in the way that they need. So yeah, I, it was great for that. And it was, it's great for beginners in that way, because then you don't have that extra step of, oh no, you know, I added my nutrients. Is it in the right range for my plants to be able to uptake those correctly? So it's perfect for beginners in that way, in that aspect, because you don't have to mess around with it at all. And the plants are happy. Definitely sounds like that would be a benefit and make things easier. Sure. Um, I, I wonder how it would impact like a half dose of nutrients versus a quarter dose versus if it's still going to adjust the pH accurately like that. And also different water sources, right? Um, you know, using tap water, which you said has like 200 ppm. How does that impact versus RO water with, you know, close to zero ppm or, or distilled yeah. water, you know, right? Um, so on and so forth. Um, so and that is definitely one of the lines that I follow the instructions on too because I was concerned about that pH perfect system. So I'm like, well, I must have to use exactly what they indicate on, on the directions to obtain that pH perfect technology. And I, so I never did really experiment outside of that. It, I should have, maybe that's, maybe that was the problem with, you know, the everything tasting the same. Like I said, I'm, I'm not blaming any of the companies for, you know, any of the situation that I ended up with, the result that I ended up with in the end, other than that was what I experienced. And maybe it was something I did, maybe it wasn't, but I have had other people say to me, um, the same about advanced that they kind of found in the end that everything kind of tasted and smelled the same. So, um, I don't know. Uh, my plants were happy. It just, you know, you, it's all about that end product. What is the, uh, what is this veg bloom nutrient you're talking about? Is that a company? You said you also oh, use you veg, bloom. About veg bloom. Yeah. Veg bloom. Veg. Uh, I think it's like veg plus bloom, a, a hydroponic research, I think is the umbrella uh, of veg bloom. Um, yeah, and they have like a veg bloom dirty, they, it goes, they have their lines specifically for your water type. 
So if you have like tap water, you want to use the dirty. If you are using RO water, you want to use a different line. So it's kind of like, you know, same thing with um, Bloom Yellow Bottles has like a European A and B and like, so everything is kind of different with their bases. Yeah, but for the most part, they, and they're powder newts too. So that was a little different for me. I was always used to bottles. So um, what switching over to that powder was definitely a different for me, but um, the plants were happy. The only thing I, I kind of didn't like about the powder was um, some of it's left in the bottom of the bucket. If you don't, you know, continuously mix it or, you know, make sure you let it sit for a while and dissolve real well, then uh, you have a little bit of um, residue at the bottom of your, your bucket. But uh, great line. I liked it. I just didn't think anything spectacular came out at the end other than what I had been seeing. So I just basically have been just trying to run everything to see what I like best. And um, that's where I've, you know, just settled on the bloom. The yellow bottles have been doing it for me. So until I find something else that that uh, will beat them, that's, that's it for now. But yeah, the veg bloom, I, I do still use... Um, the shine product that I was talking about a little while ago. I think it just adds a little bit of density uh, and that's in weeks. I generally use it weeks two on until about week five or six in flower. And then I just continue that and that's when I start the winter frost from new, millenn new millennium. That is so hard to say. Can anybody say that word right? <laughs> millennium, aluminum, millennium. <laughs> but, um, new millennium's winter frost and that's when i add that and on top of the bloom yellow bottles i just think it adds a little extra so but yeah the veg bloom great company great line it just uh moved on i'll have to check them out i'm not familiar with them okay uh, yeah. one line that i have tried which i believe you haven't tried is blue planet nutrients right you haven't tried them um blue planet there was a seaweed I think I bought like a kelp seaweed um, bottle from them once off of Amazon because I think I heard you talking about Blue Planet. So I'm, I'm going to try mm. them. And I, I loved it, but I never used like their whole line. So I thought about it for a minute and then I found Blue Yellow bottles. And so I tried them instead of ordering because the guy just loaded me up with, you know, all the free samples. And then ever since then I'm like oh sold on the bloom yellow bottles so I never went back and actually did the full line of blue planet but just that one product but and I, and I did like it it did you know work really well yeah I've used blue planet nutrients for for several years you're talking about liquid seaweed by the way I believe that's yes. the name of the bottle is liquid seaweed yeah yep, that's yeah. what it was yeah I loved it so I actually yeah. use blue planet nutrients I can speak about them for a little bit just my experience using them um, I used them for several years uh, had great results with it I started with their three-part base nutrients that they have. I think it's their high yield system. It's a three-part plus uh, a whole bunch of different additives. I think there was eight bottles total that yeah. I would use. So kind of a lot of bottles there, but yeah. um, they worked. They worked pretty good. Um, I would start with a half dose and it, you know, according to their feeding chart and everything went good. And I would just adjust based on what that runoff PPM was. Mm -hmm. And one thing I did like about them is that it almost kind of had that pH perfect in a, in a sense that advanced has. Every time I mix up a half dose of nutrients, I would get 5.8 pH, no matter what, yeah. uh, you know, no matter which additives I used or whatever. So that was kind of convenient because I knew exactly how much pH up I should be adding in. It just made things a lot easier, kind of. And then if I'm in cocoa, I usually like to do 5.8 in cocoa every time, just feed it in it every single time. And so mix up my nutrients, didn't have to do any sort of pHing when I'm growing in cocoa. So that's yeah. one thing I did like it. But yeah, I used their high yield system for, for several years. I used their uh, Blue Max. It's a two part that they have. I used that along with some additives as well. And uh, yeah, no complaints uh, on that, that avenue, so. Yeah, yeah, I definitely was going that route because I saw that, you know, your plants were liking it too. So I definitely was looking into them and did that, did buy that liquid seaweed and liked it. But for the most part, uh, I, I discovered the Bloom Yellow Bottles by chance at a local grow store's expo and uh, got sidetracked with them. <laughs> Now, do you add any sugars into your garden at all, whether it be molasses or honey or anything like that? I don't, only because I use a product called Recharge. And I'm sure most, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you and most everybody that's watching has heard of Recharge before, but it's a microbial product. 
uh, and it has molasses in it. So I don't tend to add any extra because I use that as my once a week treat, as Scotty Reel says, and uh, it, the girls are happy, so I don't tend to add anything extra. But I would, if I didn't use Recharge, I probably would add some sort of sweetener because you have to feed those microbes in order for them to keep staying alive to do their work. Because I do use, I'm a soil grower. Um, you were mentioning you, you like to do the 5.8 and cocoa and, and I'm a soil grower. I, I run um, either Coast of Maine or Route 707 I generally like. Um, and for the first like two to three, four weeks of veg and then I'll switch over to my bloom yellow bottles after that and feed after that once they start running out of food but you got to feed those microbes in order to get you know them to be able to keep doing their work to be able to get the plants to uptake those newts so yeah i would definitely use a, a sugar if i was not using recharge but i don't think it's really necessary they seem to be doing their job with the recharge yeah, recharge is awesome. That uh, microbial inoculant, which is another thing I was going to ask you about, is do you use any microbial inoculants? I use recharge as well. Mm -hmm. So um, it has the molasses in there, like you mentioned, also has kelp in there. Uh, it has a ton of different beneficial microbes in there as well. So uh, I love that stuff. Uh, do you use that throughout the entire grow or do I you do. just use it? Okay. Yeah. I know some I, people only use it in veg. I know some people only use it in flower, mm -hmm. uh, but it is safe to use throughout the entire grow. So I was curious if, if you used it throughout the entire grow or not. I do. I, I use a couple products upon transplant every time when I pot up uh, called uh, Azos and Mycos. Uh, so I use it every time I transplant up and then I water and recharge every time. And I use the recharge once a week until about five week or week five of flour and then I'll discontinue the use because I don't think it you know you know really needed too much at that point and it finishes off nicely so yeah I use it through the whole process and there's also another product from Veg Bloom that I add in every now and then because I mean what I have the bottle down there and or container I should say it's not a bottle but um of Plus Life and it's also another microbial product that is you know from Veg Bloom so I'll add that occasionally every couple weeks just to give it a little bit of different microbes in there that wasn't that's not in the recharge and it seems to be working got it in the azos and mycos uh, i've heard of that product i haven't had the chance to use them mm -hmm. uh, but i have a lot of good success that's a mycorrhizal fungi yes. type products for for both of them and i assume there's some other beneficials in there as well is that is that right yeah i mean i'm not going to be able to explain exactly what's in those things but <laughs> i used to follow uh, along with you, when I was first starting growing, I used to follow a guy on YouTube called The Grateful Grower. And when I was first learning, he was showing how to transplant. This is how you do this, and this is how you do that. And he always used a little bit of Azos, a little bit of Mycos, and um, then explained why, and then it's beneficial bacteria, and you've got to get those roots inoculated, and blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah, there, I am not going to be able to spit out the scientific name of both of those products or what's in them, <laughs> but I do know that they make a huge difference and I get really, really uh, wonderful root growth once I do uh, transplant with those two products and then water in the recharge on top. It just seems to um, explode the root growth and, and the beneficial bacteria it just makes everything cohesive and uh, yeah, exactly what they need to get going. Yeah, mycorrhizal fungi is extremely beneficial. I mean, it actually attaches to the roots and helps with the uptake of nutrients. Uh, some people actually use it as a, when they transplant, they'll sprinkle it onto the roots. Other people use it as like a soil drench, so they'll mix it in with water and then water their plant. Do you use it, uh, do you sprinkle it onto the roots at all or do you use it as soil drench or, or what? What I do is, uh, so when I'm transplanting, I basically just do my bottom layer of soil and then where I'm going to transplant in, I just sprinkle the, the azos and the mycos right on top of there. You don't have to even use very much. It's just very little. I've had the same bag for, geez, I want to say probably a year. They're just little small bags. And um, yeah, you just sprinkle a tiny bit of both of those products right in there. And then the roots that uh, have already grown and, and been um, substantial, they just kind of make that contact like you say and once that contact is made it just kind of explodes so uh and then i water in the recharge once i've transplanted that's what goes in on top of it so i think it's just kind of like a double duty hitting them from all sides similar product to azos and mycos is great white mycorrhiza mm -hmm. 
Uh, I use that as well, and I sprinkle it onto the roots. Sometimes I use it as a soil drench. Uh, I know some people that use it in their um, compost teas. They'll add that in there. Okay, yep. Um, but then there's some controversy behind it as if uh, microbes kind of compete with each other and that you're kind of wasting money because those microbes are getting eaten and so on and so forth. But we won't get into all that. But yeah. um, <laughs> I've also used uh, mammoth pea, which is yep. a microbial inoculant that uh, has microbes in there that focus on um, – Phosphorus breakdown helps with with phosphorus breakdown, and um, yeah, so there's so many different microbial products out there. And then as far as sugars, uh, we touched on that. I use molasses. I actually created a whole video on molasses. Uh, I typically use it as a soil drench. I'll actually I'll leave a link to that video down in the description section below if anybody wants to learn more about uh, molasses and how to incorporate it into your garden. So more and more places are becoming legal. More and more growers are coming onto the market. It seems like the comment sections are flooded with beginners looking for advice. What tips or advice do you have for those who are new or are struggling to get feeding dialed in? My advice is basically from my experience, just look at your plants. Look at what they're doing. Do they look happy? Are they droopy? Do, do they show signs of deficiencies? You know, are they nice and green or are, do they have spots on them? Are they yellowing? You know, you just basically, my advice is just do your research on what your plants look like. If you're spotting something that doesn't look normal, research it. There's so many great resources now that we have available to us so between forums and YouTube podcasters and everything that can basically spell it out what's going on with your plans. And basically that's the biggest advice I can give you is just take a look at your plants. What are they doing? What do they look like? Don't just automatically feed that four tablespoons or teaspoons of, you know, Fox Farm to that gallon of water. Um, or whatever that direction says, just because it says it, you know, just pay attention to your plants. And I think that that will reward you in the end. So where can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Everybody can find me on the Michigan Bros Grow Show on Sunday and Monday nights and also on Instagram at Painted Lady Gardens. And I do have a Cannabuzz account, even though I'm guilty of not checking it too often. So please forgive me, Cannabuzzers. Uh, I can be found over there at Painted Lady 13. Um, and I am excited to say that I have a, a commercial uh, possibility that I am working on right now uh, here in Michigan. I have a few partners and we're looking at opening um, a Class C facility here in Michigan, hopefully in the next year or two. Um, Fingers crossed, granted, you know, timing is right and investors are, are willing. So that's our next step um, is going into branding and, and trying to get those investors to give us the money to start growing medicine um, for everyone. So I already do that as a caregiver here in Michigan and I found, I love it so much that I just, I just want to do it on a larger scale and do it professionally. So. Uh, that's what's on the horizon for me, and uh, yeah, I would, uh, I'll be stoked to be able to say <laughs> that I'm a part of the industry officially uh, once that happens. So, yeah, come awesome. check me out on the Michigan Bros Grow Show. <laughs> I'll leave a link to your channel, to actually your Instagram down in the description section below, and I'll also link the Michigan Bros grows show is that how you say it yep grows grow show <laughs> awesome yeah that'd be great tongue twister there <laughs> well painted lady thank you so much for coming onto the podcast today it was a pleasure to have you on here and uh hope you enjoy the rest of your day thanks so much for having me i really appreciate it thanks guys